Okanagan Highlands Alliance is pleased to present the very talented Claudia Mikheyev. Otherwise known as the Mermaid Scientist, she is sharing with us her process and techniques of creating scientific illustration. We've all seen scientific illustration in the news and in our textbooks, but we don't always think about the people behind the pictures. We hope that you enjoy this video and that you're inspired to try some scientific illustration of your own. Hi there. Um, I am Claudia McKayev and my old buddy Jen, uh, actually she's one of my best friends in all the universe, asked if I could talk to you Okanagan nature enthusiasts about scientific illustration. Okay, so what is scientific illustration? It's getting things <laughs> really, really precise from different angles so that scientists and the public can clearly identify one species from another. Um, there's a couple ways to do this. Um, I use watercolor. Uh, you can use pen and ink. Some people use photographs to catalog things, but that doesn't always give the best result. Mostly because if you're following a fish in the wild, you know, you can't ask him to stop so you can count his dorsal spines or rays. And you could take a picture of him when he's dead, but then he looks dead <laughs> and not in the water. So I think scientific illustration is a great way to kind of combine, um, like, scientific like pen drawings, really exact things, kind of like this here, and pictures like, like this that you might have for reference. And then um, kind of use a little bit of imagination to create something colorful and really accurate. So you can say, wow, that Ridgeback Prawn actually has <laughs> three claws, not two claws. Um, that's, that must be what I'm looking at. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife is uh, having me illustrate some of their species for the website. Um, there's a few drawings that they're missing in their whole category of uh, commercially important species. Today's kind of like a good example, because I'm working on three different prawns, and they all have slightly different characteristics, but they're really similar. So I think it kind of illustrates <laughs> how you might go about looking at different things. So, okay, the first thing I do is go through the literature <laughs> and find all the distinguishing characteristics of these three species. I kind of highlighted just some of the good things like the proportions and then I made sketches of each one. shrimp. They're very pink and they got like a big rostrum. It's kind of like a big schnoz. And where the spines are, how like on their tail is really important. Um, next one is Ridgeback Prawn, which see how he has like a small rostrum, but in general they're gonna look a lot, a lot alike. You know, they have five pleopods, six segments, the same amount of legs, they're just, some have claws, some don't. And then the spot prawn. So we have two pandalus, and one cyconia. Cyconia, I don't know exactly how you pronounce it. I am not fluent in Latin, but. Um, 
Another good thing about working for the department is that I was able to bug all sorts of invertebrate scientists um, to try and get answers on how things look. Best thing, honestly, is to have a live sample, but I didn't. I'm lucky to have a friend, Stephanie Mutz, who is a commercial um, sea urchin diver. She took these great pictures, and what is great about this, she gave a side view, dorsal view, which is looking at the top. See, so you can really see the color of his antenna. See his two little, his eyes there. And then ventral, which is the belly, the under, underbelly, undercarriage. So you can see his little pleopods here. That's just what he looks like um, on his back, which is really rare. So in the absence of having a real sample, this was really great. And she um, also, uh, actually counted the little claws for me. So he has three pairs of his legs actually have claws, which are different from the other two species that we're gonna do. They tend to get a little bit more red when they come up at the surface, so I'm gonna illustrate them more like that with this kind of coloring. So he's still gray, but he's gonna be having those red highlights because this website is really for the public and fishermen to identify stuff that they catch. So might as well look at how, what they look like at the surface. So, okay, once I get some really good references, I take my notes, of like their, the ratio of their rostrum to their carapace to all their segments, then I'll get a really good reference photo. I get watercolor <laughs> paper. It's usually like a 300 uh, hot press or cold press, so it's super thick. And what's good about that is it's a little bit more forgiving, but then it also, you can just coat layer after layer after layer of paint of uh, thin watercolor layers, and that gives it more depth and more color. Like I think, way back in the day, like um, in the Renaissance times, they would often paint under the canvases different layers, like sometimes even gold, because even though that's not, might not be the top layer, you paint over it, it gives more depth and richness to the colors uh, after it's all finished. Um, so this is really good, because you can go through and kind of, uh, first lay down your your lighter layers and then you build and build and build and build until you get dark and finished. <laughs> so I guess I'll go through that too. Um, okay, so the good reference photo, what I do is get some tracing paper and um, I didn't want to waste paper, so I kind of just rough out, uh, sketch out a rough thing like on the computer screen. Probably not what you're supposed to do, but I like doing that because then it gives me the exact proportion, and then I can check it on my notes of you know the carapace to his tail um, to the legs. So I just want to lay it all out on here and see what it's going to look like on my paper. The other thing is you don't want to draw, be drawing and erasing on this because um, it ruins it. The more you're erasing and drawing and erasing, which would kind of be your normal process, it, it just ruins that, um, that nice spongy absorption quality that you want from a thick piece of paper like that. So, um, Trace this so I have these nice little shrimps, and then you get one of these uh, papers that, um, oh, what are they called? I don't know, it's like a charcoal tracing paper thing. And you would go on your um, blank paper. 
I always use tape so that you can get a, as exact as possible. Um, I would trace with something like, I don't know, a 2B pencil. You trace out your, about like what you want. Um, then it's gonna leave this graphite on there, which is a mess. You don't want graphite and water to mix. So what I would do here, then I go back over with like a 2B or like a really um, thin mechanical one, sketch out exactly where I, those kind of cheater lines are, those guidelines, and then um, maybe make slight adjustments just because some, I mean, the tracing is not perfect. It's not really gonna, you can't really capture everything in there, like what his stripes might actually look like or what is it, where the little reflection in his eye is. So I might put just also little references here. Then you gotta get rid of the graphite before you start painting. And this kind of like stretchy eraser is really good for that. Um, and I kind of just dab at it. So, um, it picks up that excess graphite and dust that if you put water on there, it's just going to create a muddy mess and you're going to have to go buy more paper. So here is my spot prawn. He's kind of in that phase one. Really good watercolor paints is kind of worth, worth the extra cost. You want to kind of water, add water to your paint before you actually start using it. Like let the pigments bleed into the water. You don't want to take your paintbrush, put it on the paper, and then there's all these like bigger chunks of pigment that aren't actually the color that you're wanting to put down. The first colors that you want to put down are your yellows, light pinks, light tans, um, then let it dry. In this case, since I'm working on so many at the same time, because I need to get them all done, um, like right now I'm working on about four at the same time. <laughs> so I can put one aside, let it dry, while I'm working on the, the next one. Okay, so Ridgeback, he's kind of halfway through the process. Um, you can see I just drew in legs, so I haven't gummed that yet. Um, but I've laid down some of the first layers of the tan and the pink and the yellow. And I'm leaving the white because I'm going to leave have him have more white legs. A big distinguishing feature between those three guys, the pink shrimp and him. Pink shrimp doesn't have any markings on his legs. Ridgeback has a little bit of like blotchy red markings, not that much. And then um, Mr. Spot Prawn has really clear bands. So that'll be a really nice distinguishing feature for all of them when you look at all three of them side by side. So yeah, Mr. Ridgeback, halfway there. Um, another thing that I'm gonna do actually is go through and find on the picture and the reference where his little white highlights are gonna be. And then I'm gonna mix something called frisket. And this is like a weird gummy thing that um, protects the paper from any water. It's, uh, you put it on there and then you can paint and it just repels water. So paint over it. Okay, so first, this also damages your brush, so you need a special brush that you just keep for this, so that it, you know, use your crappy old brushes for this. So, put a couple dots of this on there, paint over it with your layers, then you go back and um, erase the frisket off, and when it peels off, there's that perfect white paper underneath, and those are your highlights of where the reflection might be, or where his nice little white stripe would be. Um, yeah. So, it does take a lot of patience because there's a lot of layering. <laughs> um, layer, 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 dry, 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 layer, layer, layer. Um, 
So this guy is the pink shrimp and he's almost done. I'm still just filling in um, some of the extra highlights. So I did the frisket, but then on top of that, he has, he or she, I don't know. They, they actually change sex like midway through <laughs> their life. Uh, like a sheep head, which I didn't know. I can go through and then add these little tiny details of white, which is like, there's an opaque white that you can use with watercolor just to give it that little extra sense of dimension. Um, Cause things that are uh, whiter, they actually tend to look closer to the viewer. So if something's kind of, if you have a little spine that's protruding out on your side, you'd want to, you know, give that a little bit of a opaque white highlight. It'll help it um, just be more visible too. And spines are very important because, I mean, we're still discovering new species every day. And sometimes we're switching which family or genus a species belongs in because he, she, it, they um, have a different amount of spines. I know that happens with rock fishes. Just in my lifetime, there's been a couple. Um, and yeah, they're still discovering species like in the coral triangle, in the deep sea. So um, spines, legs, uh, fin rays, these are all important things. And I'm talking more marine, but um, it happens with plants too, sepals and seeds, and, and it also depends on life cycle. Anyway, I digress. So this guy's almost done, Mr. Pink Shrimp. I'm gonna go through and help bring out the shadows a little bit on the bottom of his tail, her tail, its tail, maybe. Maybe he's gen he or she's gender neutral, hasn't decided yet. Um, yeah, so I got my legs, my antennas, my pleopods, and everything, and I think that's about it. Visit our website, okanaganhighlands.org.